Chess shouldn't need to be complicated. When it comes to strategy, there are five main pillars, five main motifs that I go through. And in this one, I'm focusing on space. As a beginner, we know we need to control the center of the board, but what happens as you move up the ranks? How do you understand space? How do you think about space? We go over two games from the Canada tournament and explain it through different lenses so that you understand this key idea of space. We have with the white pieces, Jan Napomniachi of Russia, two-time candidates winner, and with the black pieces, Elireza Feruja, named future world champion by Magnus Carlsen right now. Jan opens with E4, E5. We're talking about space and what that is in chess. And the first part of space for all new players to understand is central control. This pawn, this pawn controls the center this night. This knight controls the center, and as the game proceeds, this bishop doesn't directly control the center, but it can attack and remove the knight, which the knight controls the center, so it indirectly controls the center. That knight controls the center. This pawn supports this pawn, and you can see all of these beginning moves are fighting for these four squares. Don't worry, we're going to get to some more complicated topics related to space in just a couple moves. Both players castle to have that king safety. Ali Reza, he strikes immediately in the center. And with this captures and this captures right here, this pawn is a, what they call a backwards pawn, which means it doesn't have any pawns right behind it to support it. And so it's, it's a bit of a weakness. It's hard for this pawn to move forward because, um, let me get a different color, because this, 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 and this are all controlling this square right here. And so that pawn can become an issue here in a little bit. The other thing that black is immediately threatening is this captures for a check to pick up this bishop. So white responds, they move here, they force the queen to move. If you're forcing your opponent to make moves, that's good for you. He's got to respond to your threats. That's awesome. Black moves backwards and we have white grabbing some space over on the queen side. So space is when you are going into your opponent's half of the board. If you have more space than your opponent, it's going to be more difficult for him to respond. Um, black moves backwards, white move forward. And after a couple more moves, we have more space. White has all of this space in black's camp that he's attacking with those pawns. And black here, he attacks that back weak pawn. And white here has a bit of a weird move. He moves his queen up to c2, but he doesn't want to trade queens. With You have a space advantage when you're attacking your opponent. You want to keep pieces on the board. And the only other real way is to defend this pawn. Let's just say you go here with your knight. Captures, captures. Now queens are coming off the board, and now your space advantage isn't going to be nearly as good. And so to avoid this or you know playing some other kind of weird retreating defense, white moves here it's voluntarily into this pin by black which is a little bit strange but we'll see how he responds and now that the queen trade isn't on the board white's able to move forward bit of a interesting move and an interesting moment here for black how he might want to respond he moves his bishop over threatening to double white's pawns which double pawns you know personal opinion i don't think they really matter unless they're isolated pawns so in this case these pawns would be isolated because there's there would be no pawns in the immediately files right next to them. So having these two pawns on the red squares, they'd be big, big targets. So white moves over here and has a dual threat on this knight. There's only one defender of this knight versus one, two attackers for the knight. So black needs to respond, moves back, attacks the bishop. A lot of times they say bishops are a little bit better than knights in the end game because they're long range pieces. So white preserves this bishop, but at the cost of a pawn, nothing's defending this pawn. So black first creates this isolated double pawn and then grabs this pawn. So black is up a pawn and black is also has a better pawn structure. That's two out of the five key strategic ideas in chess, material advantage and pawn structure. Black has a better pawn structure and better material advantage, but white has potentially the other three, um, that would be space. So white has more space. This knight's attacking all of these key squares in black's camp and has his bishop 
lined up here attacking these key squares in black's camp and also peace activity this white bishop is more active than this black knight this white knight is more active than this black knight um let's call these two equal for right now and while this queen right here is potentially more active right now it can be a bit of a liability because it doesn't have reinforcements and this rook move is going to be coming in here just any moment we see first the king defend this f3 square and then the queen needs to retreat because otherwise the queen was going to be trapped with this rook to d1 rook to d1 happens anyway to gain that open file that's a great space white's peace activity is even higher and now that white has a lot of queenside space, a lot of piece activity, white's pieces are almost all developed. Potentially, he's going to want to get his bishop here to go onto this diagonal. First, might want to get the queen out of being stuck here on a2. But before he does any of that stuff, he shoots up here on h4. Already with that queenside space advantage, you know, let's go over here and it would just be a little bit too risky for black to grab that pawn, opening up the H file. Then the rook would come over to H1 and barrel down here onto H7. The queen would be, you know, coming over here, opening up all sorts of threats right there. So that doesn't happen. And the pawn just keeps plowing forward all the way up to H7. Ali Reza has a really strong interesting response to this pushes pushes his pawn up to g5 he's thinking in a really good day you know i'm gonna start plowing all of my pawns forward and you know your king here is on g2 nothing's defending it let's see what he's able to do the white queen moves over here to d2 we mentioned that plan of getting the bishop onto b2 and now he's on this super super strong diagonal let's see if jan's able to make anything happen as a result of that, remember black is still up a pawn right here, though we can see the pressure building from white. Black bringing over his knight. He's got this check available, eyeing this f3 pawn potentially. And white here is offering a queen trade. I mentioned earlier that you don't want to trade material off when you have a space advantage and when you're attacking your opponent. However, all of white's pieces are already placed. And if this trade does happen, then black would be helping white to get a rook here onto the seventh rank, which is a super, super strong location. He'd get his other rook over here potentially. Um, so even though he'd be giving up the queens and taking those off the board, he'd be getting other stuff. Pawn's all about trading advantages. And with this check by black, um, white knows that he's not able to hold on to this F3 pawn. So he's like, yeah, yeah go ahead and grab it if you want to take the extra time. Go up two pawns in this position I don't mind. Look at these bishops and look at what they're doing. Look at my space advantage. Look at this pawn eyeing this square right here. Look at these pawns eyeing over here. I've got everything going in my favor, not to mention this queen reinforced here on the d7 square. So black here is trying to get his counterplay. White moves backwards and black goes up a second pawn. Let's see if that's going to be enough for black white here aims even further forward and we have a counter attack of both these knights and i mentioned earlier that white's knight pieces were a little bit better than black's pieces and this is no exception this knight here doesn't have any squares it can't go here you know potentially it could go backwards um or over to the side of the board we know knights on the side are not very good grim dim whatever and so this knight moves to the center of the board, a great location for the knight. And there's no pawns that black has to kick this knight out. So this knight is on a very, very strong, I'll call it an outpost, even though it's not even a defended square right now. So this knight moves out, out onto the edge of the board. And this white bishop is very, very strong. We're obviously not going to be trading it if we're Jan in this position. So he continues over here and now this knight might be a little bit misplaced it can't move into the game into either these two squares or this square or obviously here so that knight is currently trapped not able to do anything and in desperation Ali Reza he's up two pawns so he can give back a little bit of material to relieve some pressure he just abandons his bishop Jan doesn't take too much time he grabs this bishop and Ali Reza grabs a pawn so we have you know quote unquote even material but it's better to have 
more pieces versus more pawns, unless perhaps the pawns are, let's call it, all the right, all the way down on the sixth and seventh rank, then you know, all bets off in that case. And so Jan here plays bishop to f7. He's worried about you know this rook getting into the game, piling up here. So he pretty cold bloodedly just moves here to f7 into the middle of this position. And what he's thinking is, you know, once I get this c4 move in, you know, maybe not immediately right now, I'm going to be really piling up on this e5 square, potential checkmate availability there. Ali Reza, he's trying to get an attack going. He moves here to h3. Jan moves over. And in this position right here, we've got a fork between these two pieces. Jan is forced to move here to d5. And Ali Reza kicks the queen out. The queen, what does he do? Well, you know what? I've been down material this whole time. Let me grab a pawn. I'm up upon at this point. So black here moves over to g4, opening up all sorts of nasty discoveries, trying to get after this white king, because if he's not able to, there's just so, so much pressure along all these diagonals. And so Jan cold-bloodedly moves over to d3 in the middle of the game with queens on the board, with everything still in full, full you know, fight mode. The rook moves over here, and we mentioned we were trying to get this move in. Jan plays it right now, c4, and black has to give up material. What is being threatened right now? Well, other than, you know, this knight is being threatened. So let's just say that we try to, you know, move over here to avoid that. Best move, there's two moves that lead to checkmate in three. Only one of them is the one you should play, and it is, of course, sacrificing your queen right here, at least temporarily, because now you have this checkmate right there. Um, you could also, you know, take with the bishop, but it's not as flashy, so it's pretty much the wrong way to do it. Instead of that, what black has to do is give up a little bit of material. This is going to be a game of giving up material to keep the game rolling, and we have here, again, opening up all sorts of nasty discoveries, and Jan, in this position right now, doesn't want to have any of that. This knight is still under threat. And so what does he do? He blocks that discovery. He gives up material to keep the game going in his favor. Black here now, again, gives up material to keep the game rolling. Because we mentioned this is a big, big threat. And we can't allow that to, allow that to be, right? So now we have two defenders right here. If white in this position right here decides to capture this knight, then uh-oh, white's going to be losing his queen with this pin. And so he has to capture this way. That's just to disconnect the attack here onto e5, but it's just a little bit too late. After a couple more trades, again, we're grabbing this with a little bit of tempo. We have a counterattack right here. We're going to keep pieces on the board because you know what? Um, Black needs to keep stuff on the board. Well, he's down a ton, a ton of material, so he needs to keep threats alive, but it's just not quite enough. And in this position, Ali Reza resigns and Jan wins this game. If you're enjoying this so far, please consider subscribing. I try to simplify chess, simplify chess strategy and tactics to make it more enjoyable. So you could just get out there, have some fun games. Don't worry so much about beating yourself up about every single loss. I know it hurts. Okay, we're fast forwarding up to game five to talk more about space and one other nuance for advanced players. We've got Gukesh with the white pieces. He's tied with our tournament leaders at time of this recording. And we have a Petrov defense that Nijat Abasov plays. Nijat's playing the black pieces. Our last winner, Jan Nepomniachi, made the Petrov more or less completely mainstream in his world championship match against Magnus Carlsen. And we have all this normal stuff right here. And then white, um, the normal move in this position is to capture with the knight. And white decides to capture with the pawn, which is still a you know a fairly normal move, just um, quite less common. For intermediate players, I like to caution moving your pawns up to the fifth rank. I know we're trying to gain space, and that's a good thing. But once you get to the fifth rank and the sixth rank, it gets a little bit squirrely. And there is a potential downside of overextension, which we're going to see a little bit of in this game. 
Black moves back. White preserves the bishop pair. The bishops are long-range pieces. They're better in the endgame. You want to do that. Both players castles their king to safety, and we can see White grab the center here, and Black reinforce his center. So we're still going to be fighting for the center as we're also fighting for space. Black here with a5. Um, a lot of times, if you're kind of out of moves, you don't really know what to do. Um, push an a5, a4, h5, h4, assuming your king's not over there. That can be a really good way. Hey, I'm just going to gain a little bit of space while I kind of figure out what's going on. Um, Black's knight here is making it hard for this bishop to develop. And the issue that we have is this pawn is making it hard for this knight to move. While the pawn can be a potential drawback, it can also be a potential strength. It's really kind of cramping Black's style. So Black feels the need here to play F6 to free up some of this space. And that's a bad thing for Black because this white pawn can be a potential weakness in the future of something to gang up on. So White's able to get rid of that. And after these trades, we can see that White is up right now in material development. He's got these four pieces versus these three, plus his rook's already on this open file, though I guess you could argue Black does have this open file for his rook, so it's a little bit double-edged. We also had Black, he has already moved his F-pawn, and so his king might be a little bit weaker than White's king. We'll see how it plays out here. And we have a trade right there and a bishop trade in the middle. Black places his queen up on f6, and what he's eyeing, he's eyeing this f2 square with all of these pieces right here. We'll see if he's going to be able to make anything happen. White here plays c3. You might be wondering, instead of that, you know, what happens if we just go ahead and grab an extra pawn right here? It doesn't quite work out because Black has this cool pawn captures on h3. If you recapture here, you lose your knight. And so we have material equality. The game would go on in that case. And so instead of that, white plays this c3 move and the bishop gets developed out. The queen here is lining up. It's put indirectly defending this f2 square. It's lining up here. We've got one, two, three attackers versus only one, two defenders of that knight. So the knight needs to do something, decides to move back. And we have another trade. And unfortunately, that recapture with the knight's not quite the right recapture because now this rook is infiltrating. And now we've got the triple stack here on the e-file for white. Black here creates a little bit of left. And now the white queen is eyeing this knight. So let's just say, for instance, you play this natural looking move here to e8. Captures, captures. This queen gets deflected and now you lose your knight. We're also eyeing this h7 square. So if black's a little bit, little bit not careful, we could have some issues. And we have this push forward, this other push forward, and white locks it down. And now black potentially has an overextended pawn on d4. That could become a potential weakness. Obviously, white also has a potential weakness here on c5 but it looks like it's a little bit harder to get to because there's all these pawns and stuff in the way versus this black pawns right in the middle of the board. Let's see how it plays out. We have white immediately attacking there. Black jumps up right away and white kicks back and we offer, black is offering a draw right here. Does white want to take it? Maybe, no, not quite. White has more central control. His pieces are more active and this pawn is weaker than this pawn. So he wants to keep playing on. Black puts his rook right behind his pass pawn. That's a great place to put it. And now white here tries to put some pressure on the knight. We push forward. White grabs a pawn. You might be wondering, why doesn't white just grab this knight here? Well, it's not quite that simple. We have a check. And now with this queen being threatened here and the rook being threatened right there, it's just not quite that simple. So to prevent some of those complications, White decides here to just sidestep this. Now he is threatening to take the knight. So black defends, but in defending, he's extending a little bit more and potentially opening up this king here to even more threats. So the game continues. White here is lining up to prevent this pawn from moving forward, defending the b2 square, attacking the b7 square, all sorts of stuff going on. And now 
after this trade, white decides to line up and put his knight on d2. And putting a knight here in front of a pass pawn, that's a great way. It's called a blockade. Um, your knight, even though it's on d2, it can still attack all of its normal squares. So it really doesn't um, prevent that much. Um, really, one of the worst pieces to blockade with is the queen, because now the queen can't do a bunch of other stuff. But in this case, they're saying the queen would have been better. So anyway, game continues forward. King moves back. We have a little bit of shuffling. And now black is able to regain material equality. Queen moves over here. And black had the idea of pushing here this b5 pawn. I could throw it on the board, in which case white would, you know, move over here, attack this pawn after a couple of moves. It gets a little bit scary, and we have some potential simplification. Um, white would pick up one of these two pawns. Black would be down a pawn, but would be defending that way. Um, that might have been the way to go. Um, instead of that, Black moves back and just, just gives up that d3 pawn. And after a couple more moves here, we see that Black is lining up, trying to make something happen, trying to weaken that white king. And White says, okay, yeah, I'm okay with that, and moves his king over. And now we can see... This rook is, you know, potentially not going to be running away anytime soon, but black has this fork right here. Um, white in this position has this really cool simplifying tactic and does find it in the game with this check. And um, there's a couple different ways that you could go ahead and do it, but the whole idea being, hey, we're going to move this, this knight out of the way. We're going to pick up this rook. And so the way it plays out is... We capture, we capture the rook, and now we just re-fork right there, grab a pawn, and we have this position where it's queens on the board, three pawns versus four pawns, and Gukesh is going to try to squeeze this for a win. Let's see if he's able to do it. We have each move that is made, the players get an extra 30 seconds. So you'll see a lot of just checks and checks and checks to try to you know, get more time on the clock, more time to think and convert. We see black do this and white obviously doesn't want to repeat. So decides to move over this G five moves potential weakness. Um, we might have wanted instead as black to just, you know, hide your King here on H six. Cause if you're not able to get checked all the time, but your opponent is, then you should be able to find some sort of a repetitive check somewhere, find some sort of a draw. Um, instead of that moves forward and we see here this capture, which is again a mistake. We wanted to keep these two pawns together as a potential shield, but in this case, we have only one pawn. There's gonna be no hiding for this black king for the rest of the game. And we see more stuff, and the white pawn is getting very, very close. Black trying desperately for checks, trying to make something happen, pushing his own pawn. And right here, he calculates it. Okay, I can make this trade and we will both make more queens. So two new sets of queens on the board, and we have all these checks, and we see the bar jump way up in white's favor. Um, the king needed to stay away to avoid some tactics. We can't have any queen trades right now. If we have a queen trade, this king is two squares in front of this pawn. Um, if you study endgames, you know that's going to be a really, really easy win, really easy to promote that pawn for white. Um, luckily, white doesn't see it so we have the bar jumping back to equal um but unfortunately we're about to see a big big heartbreak with this check moves over and this is where the game ends black is forced to move over here then we would have this check which forces a queen trade and this pawn goes to victory this game goes to gukesh Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you're enjoying watching the Candidates Tournament as much as I am this year. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already. Have a great day, guys. I'll see you around here soon.